Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast, a CES special. There's just myself and Steve. Hi, Steve. Hello, Phil. Um, we're just going to go quickly through what happened in the last week at CES. Steve covered everything from the UK, um, which is sometimes the best vantage point um, if you want to get everything and get it quickly and find out exactly what's going on. Because if you're at the show floor, it's pointless going to the press conferences. We've tried that a number of years um, in a row and yeah. it didn't work. It never worked because you have 45 minute press conferences um, you then have 15 minutes to get to the next one. If you were trying to get into something like Samsung, you would have to miss the one before that to get into the queue to get into something like that. So um, from your vantage point, Steve, you covered everything back home in your pyjamas and your slippers and your smoking yep. jacket in the UK. <laughs> so why don't you round up uh, Newsday for us, press conference day and the announcements that were made and then we can get on to each manufacturer and what were they, are, they were actually showing at the show. So press day. Well, and- I guess press day started early because Samsung had their event the night before on the Sunday. They didn't have a press conference uh, on press day, um, which they normally do. Um, although they were doing a um, they were doing a keynote address, weren't they, later in the day? Yeah. So the the first event um, it started off as a small little shindig that you were invited along to. We all got to see things um, ahead of time. I believe the first one that we went to, Steve, it was at some kind of medical centre, wasn't it? That they just built. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was um, um, by the airport. Yeah, that's right. And it's um, and it, they just built the place, and it was nice. And, and it was a small venue. Um, the, the it was maybe what the size of um, a, a, a gym, it, just to give yeah. people an idea. So, like a basketball court type size of, of, of venue. Um, this year it was massive. Um, it was at the uh, it, it, it Caesar's Palace. It was one of the huge ballrooms. Um, they had a big stage set up at one end. the The other end was blocked off to start with because that had all the demonstration areas, and it was massive. And it was it was like a press event. So that's why they didn't have a press conference because basically yeah, this this first look event has just turned into the them having their their press conference ahead of time. And the other interesting thing was that that first at least the first couple of events because it was the medical center and then it was at another place. And they were right off the strip. They were away from the show they area. Really hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess that was a, the CTA that runs the um, that runs CES. I'd obviously said if you're going to have anything before CES, um, it has to be away from the show area because it's not you know it's not under the CES banner. But this year it was right on the strip. So obviously I think the the, the way they've, they've gone about this is just to change how that works. And and not like I say it was huge. So it was like their press conference. So we got to see their um, first look products. So basically everything that, that's that's coming this year as well. There's some concept stuff. So the micro LED. Although they're saying it's going to be a product. That's to, not a concept. That's actually going to be launched. This I know year. it's going to be a product. It's going to come out this year. But so I think a lot of people will still look at that as. A, uh, you know, it's a Halo product, and it's and it's, it's going to be pricey. Let's yeah, be honest. it's going to it's going to remain the Halo product for for a little bit of time yet. Um, and it's normally with this with it. So they didn't have a concept because they had micro LED, and they were they were pushing that. So that was the big product uh, push. 8K Samsung are right behind 8K. Um, they they they'll claim that that's their baby, um, and that they're the ones that are pushing innovation in 8K. So we'll come back to that because it's quite interesting. There are some interesting TVs there, some beautiful looking TVs there um, and they're also going to do 4K but they didn't announce anything at 4K because basically they had so many messages they said to get out that um, to include 4K as well would have, would have messed up their, the, the message that they wanted to get across at CES. 4K is coming, it's going to be later in the year. Um, so that was Samsung, that was opening day. So then getting on to press day, Steve, you had the, the normal conferences. Did anything stand out? Well, um, I mean not, I mean there was some interesting in interesting things, but they were mainly from manufacturers. Perhaps you wouldn't expect. I thought that Hisense and TCL, for any, from the point of view of someone watching the press conferences, those two were actually interesting. I have to say, the other press conferences, there was very little. I mean, running through them quickly, I mean, LG, their press conference, which was the first one of the day, that was at 8 a.m. Vegas time. Um, you know, they, they announced their real 8K TVs. Um, so they are having a bit of a bun fight right now with Samsung, um, where, where basically LG Never. are playing. It's, it's not it's like the, those two <laughs> I mean, have a bun Two fight. different organizations are certifying 8K TVs just to really make things simple. And yeah, um, basically uh, LG was saying, our TVs are real 8K um, because they can achieve a contrast modulation number of at least 50%. Um, 
now uh, if you ask Samsung they'll tell you that this year their 8K TVs will also do the same thing so I guess uh, it's a very moot point but that's what they that's what they mean by real 8K it means that the not just the resolution of the panel is 768 80 by 4320 but that the addressability in other words the, the ability to see those individual pixels uh, has to have a contrast, mod contrast modulation number of at least 50%, according to the CTA. <laughs> um, now, if you ask the 8K Association, um, which is the one that um, that Samsung kind of are mainly involved with, uh, they'll say something completely different about what you know what qualifies as an 8K TV. It's all unnecessary, in my opinion, and make, it just confuses it's consumers marketing. about a product that they don't particularly want in the first place. Yeah, it, it's just marketing and... You know who has the bigger number, uh, yeah, and, and so on. That's that's the way these things but, work. Uh, so. Yeah, so LG announced their new 8K TV. So they got the ZX OLED TV in 77 and 88 inches. Interestingly, the 65 inch that you saw at last year's CES didn't appear. It's coming. It's coming, is it? It is. Yeah, it's it's yeah. coming. So um, the they are going to give us the the, the full range um, a little bit later. So oh. I would imagine that that'll be Efa. Be reading between yes. the lines and so on. Yes, that, that makes um, sense. Yeah. So yeah, uh, um, they also had some um, some more 8K nano uh, nano cell TVs. I think Nano 99, Nano 97, and Nano 95. Um, those were in 65 and 75 screen sizes. And then there was the uh, range of OLEDs. I, um, and obviously this year it's C10 or CX. Um, and uh, sorry, uh, the 10 series or X series. So it's uh, don't B, call them X. No, <laughs> no, it's B10, C10. Uh, no E. Uh, no, no E's, E's been dropped, and uh, the reason for that is that they brought G back, and <laughs> G is now the gallery series, and I've got to say, it is a beautiful-looking TV. It, it, they've spent a lot of time on this because you can hang it flat on the wall. So the the idea behind the TV, and I, and I get it, it's it's the, to have something that's a little bit more cost-effective compared to W. So W was your wafer-thin um OLED hung on the wall with magnets, but you, but everything was in the speaker bar. So all your electronics and everything else was in the speaker bar. They wanted something along the lines of a wallpaper TV, but obviously they had to get all the electronics in there. Um, they had to have speaker. God knows how. Think, yeah, and have to meet as deep, isn't it? Exactly. Um, <laughs> this is what makes it amazing. And if you look in our video as well, in the back, you have all the cable management, which has been scalped into the back of the TV as well. Um, and it will come with the mount, which is just at the top of the TV. So there's no, the, the mount isn't in the center, it's at the top. Um, but it's flexible in, in that you can pull it away from the TV if you have to access the uh, ports at the back and then push it back against the wall. And when it's up against the wall, it is. It's absolutely beautiful. And if you manage to uh, do cable management right and have that into the wall um, so it's a way, so you have no cables visible going to the TV, it'll look the piece. So it's it's a really nice looking TV. And obviously G for gallery makes sense. Um, e, I mean, E was just a panel that was bonded onto the glass. It looked nice. I think it's one of the prettiest TVs ever made. Uh, yeah, it looked nice. <laughs> but you can see that they're, they're at least trying to change up the range because B and C remain the same. I mean, the C10 is, is identical to the C9 in terms of design. They have, they've done nothing to change and, the design. And largely in terms of features, I'd have to say. <laughs> yeah, and, and features as well. There's, there's, Although, 48 inch now, that makes, makes me No, happy. I was just coming on to this. Um, so this was the push. So um, they had a larger C10 there, but it was in the closed door demonstration area. I didn't see any on the show floor in on the stand for the, uh, the main guest there. Uh, but 48 was being pushed, and 48 has been pushed because it's, it's a natural screen progression for gamers. Um, if you're going from a proper gaming monitor with G-Sync and everything else, uh, they tend to, you know, top out round about the 40-inch mark, whereas 48 is is what LG are calling their the step up um, for gamers, and and it's definitely aimed at the gaming market. That's what they were doing at CES anyway, and uh, it makes sense. There is this thing on, on online where everybody's talking about image retention and burning and all the rest of it. The people talking about that the most are, are usually people that have the least amount of experience with an OLED TV. Uh, there's a lot of scaremongering and stuff going on. Um, you can get retention on a no TV. No prizes from guessing from who. <laughs> yeah. You can get retention on a TV, um, but as soon as you know that, that that is a possibility and that you need to look after it in terms of how you use it, so don't abuse it, um, you will have no issues. 
with with retention and bonding. It's yeah, usually... I, I've got three OLEDs in my house yeah. at the moment, uh, and I've never. I mean, I'm I'm careful and sensible, and yeah. I've never ever. I've had an occasional bit of image retention when I've been holding up when a high calibrating. contrast pattern. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But normal viewing, uh, gaming, anything like that, even leaving things on pause for a while, which I have done, um, no problems whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, and and calibration is the main one because normally what you're doing is you're sending uh, high brightness patterns in HDR mode to the TV and you will see a little bit of retention but what what happens in and what's built into the software now is that um, when you go through uh, and make measurements it will pause for a little while and it pauses long enough for that retention to disappear um, before it, it brings up any other patterns and I've seen it I've used it and I, I like Steve I use I get all these TVs in for review and they are put through a lot of testing and so on uh, high patterns and all the rest of it and you'll get a little bit of attention the only ones that don't do it are the Panasonics they, they don't do it another interesting thing I just wanted to touch on when we're talking about OLED panels um, there was a lot of conversation going on forums about how the uh, the G series the E series and the C series all had different panels from LG and LG graded these panels in terms of performance and the, the the least performing ones were put in the lower models and the the better panels went into the W series and so on. I asked that on video of Neil Robinson. Neil would know because Neil's the yeah. the engineer for OLED. Uh, Neil says that's rubbish. That that just does not happen whatsoever. And if you were going to get an honest and straight answer from LG, um, it would come from somebody like Neil, who's not a marketeer. He's not a marketing manager. Or anything like that. He's an engineer. He's in it part of the engineering team, and he would tell you. <laughs> he wouldn't have disguised the fact. So uh, that one, I think, has been put to bed. Um, I asked Panasonic as well. Again, it's on video. So go and check out our video with uh, Paul Williams. And I asked Paul the, the same thing. I said, do you go LG Display and ask for the best performing panels? Do you grade them before? And the answer was no. Anything that they do to the panel is what their engineers bring to the party and what they do with the panel once they get it from LG Display. So I think that firmly puts that one to bed. There was lots of discussion, mainly in the American forums, but lots of discussion on forums about that. So there you go. You, you've got two answers on video, and they've come from non-marketing people because Paul, well, as well as Paul's an engineer, he, he works directly uh, you know, in the corporate office in Japan for Panasonic and helps develop these models. And it's the person that myself and Steve and every other journalist goes to to discuss the finer points of the TV. So I just wanted to touch on that one because I thought it was a, an important point. So anyway, coming back to LG Steve. Um, yeah, so 8K, real 8K, true 8K, whatever, real 8K, whatever you want to call it, uh, OLED and Nano uh, Cell, they've got the full um, the full uh, OLED lineup, so that's uh, B B10, C10, G10, and then the W10, the wallpaper, one screen size, 65 inches, and also the R10 rollable, yeah. 65 inch, at a staggering, what's that, 60 grand or something? Yeah. Did I see that? It, it, right. says, it says signature <laughs> on it, anything from LG that says signature on it, is going to be expensive and and to be honest with you i can see where the expense is because you got to look at yield sizes for yeah, something well, like that they're not going to be very high so in fact i think i've got given and i think it's on video that um i think it was james that mentioned it that there were around about 50 percent yield on those um and that's why it didn't come out in 2019 as it was supposed to it will come out in 20 um but they've had to work hard to get the yield sizes up and so on so it's going to be an expensive tv um i get it from a isn't this cool perspective but like you say with a price ticket like that at 65 did you see the roll down one the, i did yes yeah. and it's it's basically the same thing but turned the other way around <laughs> um the, that's going to take a bit more development because the thing you can't do at the minute is hide that um in a traditional ceiling because that's what you would think you would think oh i can hide that in the ceiling and so on but yeah. but you've got to think joists um <laughs> and it's it's too wide to fit between even the widest uh uh, specifications for fit and joists so you're going to have to have this box um, or you're going to have to design a room where the box can be hidden away um, so you lower the ceiling or whatever but again it's a cool little thing it's where OLED's been going for a number of years I, I think I did a, an interview with uh, uh, Dave Lee at the BBC a couple of years ago and it was you were there so it would have been a few oh, years ago now and um, uh, yeah and that was one of the things I, I suggested that they could do with the technology. And lo and behold, it's it's getting there. It's taking a little bit longer than I thought it would. But then um, I suppose these things do take time. So, yeah, I did see that. I saw it on the show floor and also saw it, saw it in the um, LG display room as well. Uh, right, so wrapping up on press conferences and then we can get into things in more yeah, detail. Yeah, so Panasonic, obviously their press conference was almost entirely nothing to do with TVs. Well, they don't sell it, TV in the US. No, exactly. So. And so TVs, they mentioned one, uh, one model, the HZ2000 flagship. 
uh, and the, it literally in an hour long or forty five minute uh, press conference, it was thirty seconds. Yeah, there was uh, no so TV they, they on the stand. Just no, so, they just announced it and moved on. Yeah. Um, so that was theirs. Uh, Sony, Sony was hysterical. I mean, first of all, there was almost nothing in it about TVs. They had a car though, which were never ever going to be able to buy. Oh, um, that car, and then, Steve. And then they had the announcement. They had the announcement for the logo for the PS5, which yeah, is identical PS, yeah. to the logo for the PS4. I actually burst out laughing yeah, uh, watching yeah, the press yeah, conference. No, no, that, that was, uh, but you know, you're saying something about that car there, but. Um, do you know that that car was complete in-house Sony? So the design is beautiful. It wasn't done by Pin and Farina or any, anybody like that, you know, well-known yeah. car designers. It was done in-house by their design team. Um, and when you see it on the show floor and got up close to it and had a good look at it, um, they're not saying they're bringing it to market, they're not saying they're going to build it or anything like that, but for, it's a concept car, which is normally made out of clay. You know, if you've got a car show or whatever in the show year concept, it's normally a clay model with real wheels put on it and you know, the sale, we're thinking about building this thing. This was an actual finished product, and it was beautiful. It's one of the yeah. nicest looking cars I've seen in a long time. Um, and it had proper components on there. It had the big Brembo brakes, big discs, everything you could think of, it was in there. So, you know, hats off to them for, for doing that. They're going to do a concept. They did it right there. Um, but yeah, there's nothing else. Was uh, really... I mean, yeah, they've announced their full TV lineup for 2020, uh, 20 or at least until EFA. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, let's be honest. We'll talk about it in a minute when we talk about Sony. But uh, I've got to say, as far as uh, any news is concerned, it was thin on the ground. I mean, yeah. if your biggest announcement is a logo that looks like the other logo, you know you haven't got much to announce. So that's why I said at the beginning of this that the bits were interesting to me were Hisense and TCL because they were talking about some relatively cool kit. So Hisense, who've been, uh, obviously they do uh, quantum LED, they call it ULED, um, and they've been sort of, you know, working away on that. Um, But where they've been doing a lot of work but perhaps not so obvious in this country because they don't sell that. They do sell a couple of models, but it has, it's been something I've seen, we've seen uh, for at least the last three years at various events, but they've been doing a lot of work with laser TV. Um, and by laser TV, what I mean is it's basically you, it, you, when you buy it, it comes with a screen, uh, a fixed screen you can fit on the wall. Um, it's basically a short throw laser projector, but it has got a tuner built in, which is why it's mm-hmm. effectively a TV. Uh, and they had a new one, um, which uses a trichroma laser. So in other words, three laser, red, green, and blue. And that, they claim, can hit 100% of Red 2020. So there will be the, that will be the first display I'm aware of um, outside of, you know, maybe some professional displays or other stuff, but yeah. certainly consumer product that can hit 100% of Red 2020. I believe it's a first, Steve, because, yeah. I mean, what you're talking about, uh, just to you know clarify for people, when you're talking Red 2020, you're talking really narrow in terms of That's why spe- using a laser, spectrum. <laughs> That's why you're using a laser. And the only products I know that, that can do that are professional projectors, laser projectors yeah. For, yeah. from likes of Christie and so on. So, so yeah, I mean, that, as a consumer product, unfortunately, it's not coming to the UK, but we do get laser TV yeah. in the UK. And the 120-inch was, uh, I think it's at 12 grand, 13 grand for, for the 120-inch. I've got to say, the hang on, hang on. The, the point I'm coming to, Steve, yeah. it's an important point. They've got 100-inch coming out this year that is going to be available in the UK. Guess what the price is? Hundred inch laser projector. Yeah, uh, five grand. Four and a half. Oh, not bad. <laughs> for a, for a hundred, <laughs> for a hundred inch, uh, you know, laser TV from high sense. Four K. Four K. Yeah, and it comes with a screen and everything. Yeah, uh, it's four and a half. And grand. the sound system as well, doesn't it? Uh, no, this one doesn't have the sound system. Oh, right. It loses. Okay. Sound. Obviously, they've got to lose some Something, something yeah. to cut it down, but it doesn't come with the sound system. But then, people that are going to be interested in this, you would imagine, would have their own they sound system sounds. anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. I just thought it was an interesting price point. Yeah, going no, from, and they look good. Yeah, the ones I've seen have been quite impressive. Yeah, no, they have done. Uh, so, uh, High Sense are only two hour drive away from me. So, uh, February or March, I am going to go down and see the laser TVs because obviously you can't send these out for review. They're 100 inch, 120 inch. Uh, there's no way I can only get a 65 inch through my door. <laughs> Um, I couldn't get a 100-inch bloody fixed screen into my house. No, well, you'd have to fix it on the wall and that yeah. kind of thing. So it's easier yeah. to go to them because they've got proper demo facilities and set up and I can be left alone to play about with it. So we're going to do that. So anyway, but, High Sense, yeah, they're doing some yeah, inter- they're interesting doing some good things. Stuff. I mean, 4K, yeah. HDR, like I say, 100% of Rec 2020. They've got um, ones where the screen rises up, which is quite cool. Ones where they actually use the screen to bounce sound off to basically create the audio f- from the screen which is quite cool. So they've got some really interesting stuff going on there. And conversely, TCL, uh, the other Chinese manufacturer, um, also doing some interesting stuff because they've been pioneering uh, mini LED. Now, not to be confused with Samsung's micro LED, there's a traditional LCD panel uh, with a with an LED backlight, a direct array LED backlight um, with dimmable zones, but 
uh, unlike most TVs, these have 20 or 30,000 LEDs behind the panel and you know, 5,000 dimmable zones. So you're getting a performance. And they'll say that the reason that they're, they're pursuing this is because micro LED is incredibly expensive, which, which it will be, um, and dual LCD, which is another way of trying to get great uh, contrast performance from an LCD technology, um, which it does do, um, isn't very bright. And, and I can believe, because you've got literally got a second LCD in the way of the backlight, Yes, I can believe that and would viewing be the angles case. as well. Yeah. And the viewing angles as well. So this this gives you um, you know, the kind of massive brightness that you might get from um, from a micro LED and the deep blacks and and with five thousand dimmable zones, you know, you you're not gonna get any real haloing or or, uh, or or blooming. So you're getting, you know, the the best of most worlds, even though it's not quite as good as say micro LED in terms of being self emissive. Uh it's certainly an interesting technology. And also the what's new about their Vidrian mini LED yep. is that it's actually built into um, so they've they've taken the mini LEDs and they've directly infused them into a crystal clear glass substrata um, behind the uh, behind the uh, panel. So that looked interesting. Did you actually get a chance to see it? I did. I spent some time with it, and uh, the material that had on it was obviously to represent the white colour and all the rest of it. I mean, it, the, you weren't seeing any film material on there or, or TV material or whatever, but it looks impressive. What really impressed me was the thickness of the panel. Um, it's not as thick as you think it is going to be, um, and certainly not as thick as, as when you're thinking about the dual uh, dual cell stuff, which uh, High Sense was showing off on on their stand, um, and and they are quite chunky when you look at those. Yeah. Um, no, the TCL, the, it, it was really nice, and they also had some um, uh, concept stuff as well. So they had the the Vidrian, which is a proper product, uh, and will come out this year. But they also had some concept stuff that they were doing in a little concept black concept room, um, where they'd gotten it even thinner. So the, um, <laughs> so the, so the you know the 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 components were pushed right in towards each other. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. It uses um, obviously blue light, blue LED light, uh, with the the QD filter on top of that, um, which is what we were talking to uh, Nanosys about in a in a product a podcast a few months ago. Um, so it's interesting that they're, they're using that, and it's the the LEDs are blue blue light. Um, so that's that's where it's getting its. Uh, its uniqueness from um, and it'll be interesting to see with so many dimming zones how good their dimming algorithm is because at the end of the day they, and this is yeah. this is what Samsung get right and I think people forget um, you look at how other manufacturers do their local dimming and that's usually where the weak points are um, because you have to do so many hundreds of millions of comp- computations um, for the system to learn how to do it to start with um, but but that's where a screen like that is going to live or die. It's going to live or die on how well they do their yeah. algorithm yeah. Uh, when it comes to dimming. But yeah, it was interesting. So it would it would be nice if they could release some of the TVs they've released in the states in this country because certainly the Roku six series and the eight series, which actually has mini LED as a backlight, um, they looked really good. And and I love the way that they're um, supporting these TVs. You know, adding things like VRR and EARC um, to 2019 TVs, which a lot of manufacturers are not doing. Um, it, was, it was good to see them, you know, pushing a, 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 a sort of a policy of, of trying to keep older TVs up to date as well. Um, and, and a bit like LG, they're obviously heavily going for the gaming market with TVs with low input lags, ALLM, VRR, yeah. HGIG, 120 hertz, um, HDMI support, and also they announced they, I think they're the first with the THX certified game mode. Yeah. Yeah, so some really interesting stuff coming from them as well. So that was press day. So let's get into the products. Let's talk about the products. Let's stick with TCL while we're talking to them uh, or talking about them. So I met up with Marek, um, who's the director of the product development for Europe uh, for TCL. Um, he was he was really, really busy. He was literally going from interview to interview to interview. And I said to him, by the end of the day, you'll get it right then, because eh? <laughs> you'll have done it so many times. Um, but that's how busy the, this show is. And, and literally, when I turned up at the stand for my meeting with him, he was still being interviewed by another news team from another organization. So uh, he did spend time with me. He went around. He showed me the, the products um, that, that are not coming to the UK. So Redrin's not coming to the UK. Uh, there's no plans for that. <laughs> Thanks, uh, which, <laughs> you shouldn't be shocked about that because, um, and he explains it in the video, so if you want the full details, go and have a look at, at the video. Just click on the CES 2020 um, menu thing at the top of the menu, uh, top of every page it's there, it says CES 2020, and you just click on that and um, it'll bring up all the videos, all the news stories that we're talking about if you want to go into them in more detail. 
Um, but yeah, you showed me the products that are coming. So it's QLED TVs um, that are coming this year. Um, they're a bit higher spec than the TVs that we've seen so far. And it's going to be a gradual process for, for TCL. They're coming into a new market. And the main thing for, for these uh, manufacturers that are coming to market is to get buyers. Um, if they can't get the buyers on board, then these TVs don't turn up in shops. So while our forum members and ourselves might be berating companies and saying, why are you not bringing this product in? And I, I demand you sell me this. It, sometimes it's just down to the fact that they can't get these things into retail premises and get them seen and so on. And there's other things behind the scenes, which is certainly delayed TCL is, is the whole free view um, an Android platform and getting that certified and working and so on. Um, that's what's taken them the time to to get things I'm ramped up. They haven't considered so. using the Roku platform because it seems like a lot more uh, robust. Roku will be coming in, but Roku's <laughs> slightly further down the range a little bit, and certainly that's the way uh, High Sensor also bringing um, Roku in. So Roku's sort of five hundred quid and below in terms of ironically, you give me a choice between Roku or Android as OS. I take Roku every time. <laughs> I know where you're coming from, but I've got to say, um, just to be fair to Android, when it is implemented with a decent uh, and like fast on chip, TV. like on Philips and like on the new Sony's, because Sony have finally got got the right uh, MediaTek chip to work um, and work properly and and display it, because I haven't had any issues with Sony TVs this year that I've had in for review, um, whereas that wasn't the case in the past. Um, once it's up and running and and it's really running quite nicely now on Pi, um, uh, Android's not a bad system to be honest with you. It, it's sometimes it's down to the implementations of of these things. But yeah, getting back to uh, TCL, they they're up in the models, they're up in the features. Um, it's just going to be a little bit of time and and getting into retailers and also kind of building a name for themselves as well because they're not that well known outside of uh, of circles like like ourselves who you know we watch TVs worldwide, whereas um, uh, people in the although- UK. Pro- According to their press conference, they are, I think, the third largest seller of TVs in the States. They're, they're really mm. dominating. They're doing well there. They are. They're, they're doing really quite well there. And obviously, the, the US range compared to what, what we get elsewhere, it seems as on it's the high sense stand. <laughs> yeah. So that's TCL. One to watch out for this year. Um, I did speak to Marek. I pleaded with him to say, look, give us some retail, you know, retail review samples. Um, there might be an invite in there as well to have a look at the factory and, and that kind of thing. We'll come back to that um, later in the year. I'm sure we'll be talking a bit more about this brand because um, they have ambitions. At the minute, it seems to be red tape. They need to be cutting through and, um, and also figuring out exactly what they want to sell in the UK. But interesting brand and some really interesting technology which moves us on to Hisense um, who've been doing really well in the UK um, unfortunately OLED didn't do very well for them and that was basically because they had to compete with some well established brands and there wasn't enough difference between um, the ranges no. <laughs> the and, price and differential was, was, was it, negative and, and it wasn't it? and it wasn't high sense's fault either because no. you know they, they, they just didn't have any room to move with that one um so they've gone back to qled which i think is a good move for them because they have because qled is such a big thing and L- lcd is such a such a big market they have room to move and they have room to develop their own product there and um the the QLED sets that we're getting in are really nice. The full array local dimming, the two uh, that are coming in, um, they're going to have decent um, features on there as well. Um, I really like their smart TV system, even though it's not a a, a well established or, or well known name. It works really well. It's really quite a clever system, and it was really quite intuitive to use uh, when I used it this year on the OLED and on the on the A7. A little bit of uh, tinkering with their model numbers as well so we were on the B series for 2019, we're going back to A series <laughs> for <laughs> for 2020 which is a little bit confusing but basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to get a standard worldwide for their model numbers which I wish more manufacturers would do yeah, to be, be honest <laughs> um, so yeah the two TVs that are coming in they look really really interesting, there's, there's also the uh, mid range TV which replaces the B7500 which is now going to be called the A7500 and again for a TV that's going to be around about 500 quid um, for large screen sizes I think it, it looks like really good value for money, what always surprises me with with high sense when you compare them to the likes of um sharp and jvc and so on you know tvs that are in that that level of the market which we don't review for obvious reasons they're, they're under 500 quid and people don't read reviews at that price point but when you look at them and compare them to high sense high sense absolutely murder every tv when it comes to build quality i don't know how they do it and make money 
Um, but Hisense, when it comes to build quality and the materials that they're using and the chassis designs, um, the the head and shoulders above everything else at that price point. Um, mm, and then definitely. you've got, got image quality on top of that. So unfortunately, no ULED XD coming to the UK. Um, and when I was speaking to Aaron, and there is a video there of Aaron um, talking about the, the ranges for this year, he was just as gutted that it's not coming to the UK. But obviously, again, it comes down to business um, decisions that have to be made you know, is there a market for it and so on and, and he gets it because I said well you know you need a halo product you know Hisense need to build up the, the brand image and brand name and it would it would appear that XD would be a great way of doing that and he didn't argue with me he just said the decision has been made not this year <laughs> Maybe next year, but then it is going to be a busy year for them, which is yeah. uh, you know something that he explained as well. <laughs> because they, they sponsor the Euros. They sponsor the Euros, <laughs> yeah. And and I did as much pleading and begging to get free tickets as possible <laughs> for the games. But um, yeah, they've got a busy year coming up with the Euros, so you know they've got that to concentrate on, and and that does build a brand name as well because people who um, I socialise with out with um, AV and they don't really know what I do for a job and so on. I've heard them mention Hisense. Um, so the brand rec- recognition is getting out to the wider pro- public, which is working for them. Um, and two nice products coming in this year, so which should do well for them, and hopefully we'll get the review samples in for those. Right, so um, that's two Chinese manufacturers out of the way. Let's go to Sony next. Um, mm. Had the Black Room demonstration. Uh, a couple of things that I really do like about what they've done um, and change things up and uh, I'm going to give the kudos to Gavin uh, McCarran here because he has changed the way he does his demos in the past um, Sony demos were some of the some of the <laughs> some of the um, I'm, I'm trying to be diplomatic here basically Most strikingly different between two TVs yes, I've ever seen yes which <laughs> Which they've done away with, because this year's Black Room was, was not like that. All they did have competing models, but it was on a very level playing field. Um, and they didn't say, our TVs do this better than this TV, and you should buy our TVs because of this and so on. Um, I kind of think they got they get the point on that now. Um, so yeah, there were, there were good demonstrations done in that room. Um, the ZH8, which is their LED flagship Master Series, um, that's a direction that they're going because I know yet again that there's no large screen sizes for OLED. They're sticking with 55, 65. The AG9... I don't think anyone apart from LG does a 77-inch. I think Sony want to bring one in and I know that Panasonic are desperate to do it but they're saying again it's a supply issue. So Right, yeah. Um, so, I'd, you know, Panasonic absolutely desperate to do it. I, I, I get that feeling. Really? Getting... I thought they might not be so keen because they do push that GZ, sorry, HZ or all the GZ. 2000 is in is, is a lot of them are pushed to mm. professional users who don't want a 77 yeah. presumably. Read, reading between the lines of conversations I had which I, I I would never repeat conversations word for word but reading between the lines I, I, I get the distinct feeling that they would like to do maybe not as the top range but they would certainly like to have a larger screen in there yeah, in yeah. the range um, and probably the same with Sony if, if they haven't already got a 77 I think they might sell a 77 in the US Steve well, I'd, I'd, have to, do. Do. I'd have to. I'd have to double yeah. check that one. So I just, I just, certainly, this at, the, at CES, no one announced a 77 inch no. apart from apart from um, from LG. Uh, LG, uh, and it yeah. was their 8K 77 inch that they announced. But that also, there's also the. I mean, they've also got the, the, the C10. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Of course they have. Right. Anyway. Uh, where was I? Yeah, Sony. So the the larger screen sizes, they are going to be uh, LED models, the Master Series stuff, the ZH8 or the Z8. H in the US. <laughs> Thanks a bunch, Sony. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's an impressive looking TV. I've got to say, it was it was up there with the uh, with the Samsung Q950 in terms of design. I think it's a really nice looking TV because what can you do with something that's 75 inches and above? There's not a hell of a lot you can do. I like the way they've designed the stand, which is it's out with the screen, so you're not going to get screen reflections and so on from it. And they'd obviously put some thought into that. Um, Obviously, the, the problem with that is you need a really, really wide TV cabinet if you're going to have um, one of the Sony screens. They had the uh, BVM X300 set up in the room um, next to a couple of TVs, and obviously they were showing you how close they were getting to that out of the box compared to others. And they had a Samsung Q950. 
last year's. Last year's Q950, or was it the Q900? I'd, it's either different in the States. Um, I think it's and 900 it was, in the States, 950 yeah, in the UK. So it's I think thing. it was. But anyway, um, they, they had them side by side, and obviously they were showing uh, differences in local dimming. Obviously, um, you know, Sony's approach to local dimming is a little bit different in terms of... I, I would think the sound's going to be better at local dimming, wouldn't it? Well, I'm coming on to this. So <laughs> if, if you want black bars and you want um, a, a dynamic contrast um, the Samsung in terms of to the eye perception wise was blacker um, it was crushing du- uh, the black level though um, so it was crashing some of the shadow detail compared to the Sony the Sony was a much more balanced image uh, far closer to the BVMX 300 so if you were, if you were saying our screen this is what our reference point was then the Sony was closer than the mm-hmm. Samsung was in this demonstration and again, stressing that it is a manufacturer's demonstration. Um, however, the Sony black bars were not black. You know, the one inky black, which I get their argument in terms of they want to have a balanced screen. And if the director says he wants you to see shadow detail and it's shown on a professional monitor, the shadow detail's there and it's there on their screen, I get that. What I don't understand is how they do, or why they don't have enough zones to turn them off. <laughs> to turn them off. You will still yeah. get some light leakage into the black bars because you've got to think that you're going to have a zone close to uh, the black bars but and again it comes down to how different manufacturers have different algorithms in terms of the local dimming and um, again it it wasn't as contrasty it wasn't as deep black and the black bars weren't as black but it was matching what the professional monitor was doing Um, whereas the Samsung was a far more dynamic picture but it was crashing detail Um, so yeah uh, it'd be interesting to see those two v- TVs side by side in circumstances where I had the remote control um, but certainly in that demonstration and, and they weren't being unfair to Samsung they didn't say anything negative about Samsung um, or the TV they just said look these are the differences um, and obviously they'd, they'd set them up um, for the demonstration and they did that a number of times with the models so the ones that are going to be of interest to forum members are the XH90 and the XH95 um, the 90 it replaces the um, XG85 and the XG95 gets replaced by the XH95 um, some bits and pieces in there that, that are a little bit different and some technology that moves uh, down the range um, into these models so the main one is that the 90 is going to be a fouled backlight where it was edge lit the XG85 is edge lit um, so it's going to have full array LED X motion clarity and the new X balance speaker they were putting a lot of effort into improving the audio on these LCD TVs um, with the way that they're, they're going to they create the audio from, from the TVs and I've got to say the the demonstrations they did with the audio it, it sounded really good so the uh, XH90 comes in 55, 65, 75 and 85 um, and it has the new remote control uh, the XH90 uh, also has let me just quickly check through uh, Apple AirPlay HomeKit Google Assist Android 9 Pie um, Alexa support multi-acoustic audio um, and the uh, positioning of the tweeter on this side of the chassis um, so yeah it's a little bit different and a, a bit of a step up um, on the 85 this year and then the XG95 gets replaced by the XH95 and differences there are they are bringing X wide angle down the range so last year on the 95 it was only available on the 75 and 85 it now starts at the 55 so 55, 65, 75, 85 will have X wide angle not sure how I feel about that because it does impact on the contrast um, of the TV set so it does improve the angles but uh, certainly from the TVs that I have reviewed that have that technology it does take a little bit away from, from contrast which also happens on the Samsungs um, a little bit you know there is a contrast difference there when you add the filter in it'll be interesting to see if any changes have been made on the X wide angle um, or if it's the same as it was on the Z model that I reviewed anyway other stuff in there um, it's using by amplification for the sound again so uh, the speakers in the bottom of the TV use a separate amplifier to the tweeters um, which is supposed to improve audio and like I say in the demonstrations it sounded really quite nice for a TV um, x balance speaker it has a backlit remote the XH95 so the new design but it has the uh, motion sensor in it so when you, you pick up the remote it will automatically light up for you and when you place it down it, it dims itself down after 6 seconds um, 
other things it's got ambient optimization on the audio so it uses the microphone in the remote control and it, it does a very basic um, acoustic o calibration of your room for the speaker which I thought was a nice little touch it's something we've been speaking about doing for a while or want manufacturers to do for a while with these things so it's interesting to see that Sony brought that in so those are the two models I think are going to be really interesting to uh, forum members and then you come onto OLEDs um, now the AG8 is being discontinued and that's replaced by the A8 and differences <laughs> differences are it's uh, it's now moving to the X1 Ultimate processor so it gets the okay. same processor as, as the AG9 it also gets the pixel contrast booster X motion clarity which is brand new uh, on the OLED model so the A8 is going to have that and that's basically um, uh, black frame insertion so the AG9 is that being it's, phased out? It's staying for this year. Um, reading between the lines, all of this was not confirmed by Gavin. This is my opinion. Um, I think we're looking at IFA um, and a possible new uh, flagship OLED from right. from them at IFA. That is my guess. It's a guesstimate from me. I have not had that confirmed. I didn't have any conversations where that was mentioned by anybody from Sony, just to make it clear that that's that's what I think anyway. Um, so the AG9 is continuing. The AG8 um, now has they've changed the the audio, um, so uh, it has a little bit more bottom end. So it's got two subwoofers rather than woofers built into the the screen now. Um, and the actuators have been fine tuned, so the actu actuators are a little bit further up than well, they have been a little bit further up on the on the screen compared to the woofers. Uh, but they are they're going for subwoofers now, or they're calling them subwoofers. They're larger drivers, um, which should give a, a little bit better audio quality. It also has the acoustic auto calibration built into this one as well. So, um, so yeah, it looks like a really nice OLED TV that's, that that should be mid market. Um, so it's round about your your sort of uh, C10 level of the market um, and like I say it comes with the X1 Ultimate which is what's in the XG9 at the minute sorry the AG9 at the minute so um, yeah it looks like an interesting TV like I say AG9 continues over um, and we've mentioned the the, uh, the yeah the AG9 TVs. continues over but confusingly there's also an A9 in 48 now, now, screen size <laughs> yes the A9 is a 48 inch it wasn't at the show it's going to be later this year, and again, um, they didn't say how late in the year. So again, that could be another. So it could be the A nine series. Yeah, that, that, that's, why I'm, that's, that's why I'm. That's why I'm. Yeah, that's why I was thinking sense. along that. Yeah, that's why I was thinking. Otherwise, that. it makes no sense to call it an A nine. So it's confusing the issue, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> to be it, honest, it does. At, at least uh, you know Sony are trying to make an attempt to try and keep things. Uh, worldwide, so you, you know that the US model is going to have the the G after the the number. <laughs> um, yeah, so in the US it would be like X ninety five H, but over here it's X H ninety five. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's the way it works anyway. So that's a Sony range. Um, some some improvements in there. I'm not sure about X wide angle. We will see when the when the when we get the the review samples in for that how how that works. Um, but again, Sony are pushing stuff in terms of creators intent, and this is a company that makes the cameras that many motion pictures are shot on. Um, they make the uh, grading suite monitors that many of the movies are are graded on. Um, so this is a company that should know what they're talking about when it comes to creators intent and and getting that into consumer models. It's just a shame that again, like every, everything else, it's iteration. Mm -hmm. um, of of existing products and so on. So that's Sony done. Let's move to Panasonic. Uh, talking about creators intent, HZ two thousand is uh, the GZ two thousand <laughs> with HDMI two point one ish. No, it's it's not it's not full bandwidth. I thought like, that's why I said ish. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, they're they're going to bring it. Well, it always had um, auto low latency mode, yeah. um, and it's now bringing in. Um, EARC. Um, so the, there was some confusion because in my interview with Paul, he mentioned HDMI 2.1, but he, he was also on a phone call straight after the interview just to clarify. And he was told, yeah, it's full, full um, 2.1. But then quite a few forum members mentioned, well, hang on, that mentioned VRR. So I had to get back onto Panasonic in the UK. They got back onto Japan. There was obviously a bit of time delay because we're all on different time zones. Um, 
and in the end it's not full bandwidth um, so to me it'll be HDMI 2.0 just with these uh, 2.1 features enabled on them that's what it looks like which uh, is a bit of a misstep I think not just from Panasonic but Sony's the same so Sony don't have HDMI 2.1 features uh, the full bandwidth 48 gigabits per second that doesn't exist on the Sony um, OLEDs either so uh, that'll only be on the 8K models so again, a bit of a misstep there, especially if you're bringing in the PS5. <laughs> it, it's a strange one, isn't it? Yeah. You'd think, you'd think like, yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess is that. I mean, it depends on how they've implemented it. But there is a, theoretically they could add these things at a later date, couldn't they? It all the depends thing on you the silicon. Absolutely yeah. have to have HDMI 2.14 for uh, full, full 48 gigs per uh, 48 gigabits per second is um, 8K, isn't it? Yeah, so everything else you could theoretically stuff down two point zero, fiddled or light version of HDMI two point one. You could. I just think from a marketing point of view, uh, it's a lot easier to say HDMI two point one. <laughs> Full. Uh, yeah, they're going to saying... be a lot of fudging from all the manufacturers, yeah, yeah. pretty much. Even even LG aren't free of this. Uh, yeah, so uh, it is a bit baffling why they haven't gone with, with full HDMI 2.1 at the minute. But anyway, um, GZ two thousand was a great TV, fantastic TV. Um, the HZ2000 has the, the new panel, um, so so this year's panel, OLED panel, but um, it, there's not a lot of other changes in there. It will do Dolby Vision IQ, um, it has filmmaker mode, and so on. We're going to come back to these two. When, when you say it's got a new panel, um, so this is their new version, so the custom pro panel from last year, this is different. Th- that's what Paul told me, he said it was a 2020 panel that they've done the custom stuff on. Okay. So until I, until I can get an eyepiece up against the panel and have a look at the the pixels, um, I can't tell you for sure. I can just tell you what Paul's told me, which was it's a 2020 panel um, with their uh, custom gubbings on the back and what they do with the panel. So I am assuming that there's there's a slight pixel change or whatever in the panel. If it's a new 2020, it it could be different. Uh, we won't know till we can have a look basically and see. Uh, that was my understanding on it. Um, but again, you know, it's there's, there's going to be more in the range. Panasonic are going to do their TV announcement. There's no convention, Panasonic convention going forward. Um, they've decided to split uh, the convention up because basically the Panasonic convention was everything that Panasonic does um, at one venue and you're all put in little groups and you were taken around the whole venue. So if you were interested in TV, you got to see TV, but you also got to see beauty, hairdressing, um, how to put your makeup on. <laughs> Yeah. Um, photography and all that kind of thing and um, Panasonic are now taking the approach of they are going to do each separate thing with the people who cover that area um, and be more focused so they're going to have their TV event I think they said around about February so we'll get the full range we'll get the full details um, we'll have all the forum questions that people want answered put to uh, the Panasonic reps there but in terms of a new TV, that was the announcement that was made. Um, they don't sell in the States. So all the stuff that we saw there was in the MGM. They had their own uh, setup because, and the reason they do this is not because of journalists being there or whatever. Um, it, CES is the biggest show in terms of buyers. Um, and if you're trying to get your TVs into store, um, you need to do CES. So the Panasonic will have their 2020 lineup there. But you just didn't get it. Yeah, it's not yeah. open to the public or to, to it's not open press. Yeah. It's just for dealers, I see, isn't it? it re- a lot of CES is just for dealers. Yeah. That's that's where you get your big buyers. There's a lot from. going on behind the scenes. Yeah, that you don't ab- know, absolutely. Don't I mean, there's nowhere. you know, you get the CES show in the convention center. You then get out to look at some of the stuff that's in these hotel suites. But you know, there's lots of things, other things going on, and it, it is the biggest event of the year for that type of thing. So, I uh, like to say February will get the full details for for Panasonic. I think there'll be some interesting stuff there um, that that we're being tight lipped about at the minute. Um, and like I say, we can we can get really into the details of of their range um, a little bit deeper when that happens. Um, so let's go to LG for st- sticking with OLED at the moment. Um, so yeah, the BX, the CX, or the B10, C10, I think LG want to call it 10, so we'll stick to 10. Um, they are basically the same as this year, although they, they have the faster generation processor in there. So They've got the third gen, haven't they? Third generation, uh-huh. so it'll be it'll be the A7 third gen and the A9 third gen, although although that wasn't confirmed for the, the B10, you can guess that that's exactly what it is. 
yeah. and that's what exactly what it's going to be. Um, yeah, some nice features in there. Some of the stuff, or a lot of the stuff, is is our, our options that we would basically tell you to switch off, um, which is extra processing, extra edge enhancement, uh, face recognition, and trying to um, change face uh, details and all that kind of thing. Um, but again, LG are really good when it comes to calibration, that they understand the whole as the director intended and that people want to see it that way as well. So you can switch all this stuff off. Um, they have filmmaker mode on there. Uh, if you're a professional user, they have a hidden menu. Um, it's not really hidden, it's just you need a code to get into it. And the vast majority of forum members and the members of the public don't need access to it. Even professional calibrators don't need access because it's basically for users that are using the TVs in a studio environment where you're using SDI instead of HDMI. Mm-hmm. Um, SDI doesn't, co- doesn't contain any flags or information, whereas HDMI does. Um, so if you're using an HDMI connection, it tells the TV what what the content is that you're watching, and that's how it can uh, switch into the right gamma mode or PQ mode and so on. If you use an SDI in a studio environment, it doesn't have those flags, so you have to go in and um, fix it. And it's something that the OLED screens haven't had um, until this year. And it's obviously a request that's come from Hollywood because Panasonic are doing it as well in their TV, so you can go in and you can switch tone mapping off so they set hard clips. Um, and LG is doing the same thing. Uh, it's a nicer menu layout that they have, and you can select uh, PQ or um, Gamma um, or what color space you're working in, that kind of thing. HLG. Uh, so it's basically so uh, studios, um, professional users can switch. It's nothing to do with the consumer side of things, um, although it is interesting to see that they're doing that. So you can go in there and switch TV to hard clip. And I suppose as as enthusiasts and as um, Reviewer Steve, it's interesting that to use that mode, you can switch it off to hard clips and then you can switch on tone mapping and actually see how it tone maps. Um, so mm-hmm. there's an interesting angle there, I suppose, for, for, for an end user. <laughs> Play about with for five or ten minutes and it's always nice to find hidden menus and say, oh, I know how to get into that menu. But apart from that, for us, it's it's going to be nothing. It's for the professional users um, at the end of the day, those modes. Um, I'm trying to think what else there was wasn't there. a lot new, but in fairness to LG, there was, you know, what else could you possibly add to this, the, the 9 series? It didn't already have. It was already feature-packed to the gills. The only thing it didn't have, and annoyingly they still won't put it on, is... HDR10+. Plus. I think Neil gives a, a non-marketing answer in the interview. So that's the, the videos, the LG C10, G10, OLED picture settings, picture quality and panel details. That's the name of the video. Um, watch it on YouTube or get it through the CES menu on AV forums. And give it a watch because, like, like we've already said, Neil's not a market guy. He's not a product guy in terms of trying to sell product. And he gives a really interesting answer as to why they don't have HDR10 Plus on there. At the end of the day, it's a political decision. We all know it's a political decision because it's Samsung technology, and you, you know, yeah, it's just LG annoying, th- really, because you know, if you, if the the nine series or the new ten series had HDR10 Plus support, I mean, it'd be near perfect telly, really, in terms of features and why everything is it, else. Why is it not at the moment? Because, because, go and listen. I don't know if you've heard Neil's I, I reply. Listened to it and, yeah. and I thought, yeah, but you know. But you know, and I, I've, I don't want to knock HDR10 Plus, but in the side by sides I've done um, with HDR10 Plus and Dolby Vision, Vision's always looked far superior. Um, yeah. You know, HDR10 Plus eight clips, um, and you know it's. It's not the same, and it and it doesn't go through the same quality control process um, and trims that Dolby Vision content goes through. Um, and we've had this discussion in the past where you know we we did the thing at Dolby earlier in the year, and you know they do the grade in HDR, and then they check. They also go through and do trim checks on, so, so they get everything from that one grade basically. Uh, but then they go back in and they look at the seven oh nine version of it. And if it looks different, then they go in and, and they correct it. Um, that seemingly doesn't happen with how they're doing HDR10 plus stuff. Um, mm. And Neil gives a decent answer there. I know what you're meaning from a market point of view, from a tick, yeah, I just tick think box. From a consumer's perspective, they like to tick boxes and think, well, this has got both, yeah. this hasn't. Yeah, that's it. It comes from a, a box tick exercise, but yeah. Um, so yeah, there's lots of things that... Um, there that are, are interesting like I say this the C10 the B10 you know what you're getting with that TV it's it's this year's version of it um, it's going to have filmmaker mode on there a couple of little tweaks here and, and there Dolby um, Vision IQ 
Dolby Vision IQ, um, and it also has uh, in Carman a uh, few little bits and pieces I've, I've changed in there as well. Um, nothing major, just little improvements and so on. Uh, I forgot to yeah, say... The main, the main improvement was that um, if you're using the built-in pattern generator it's at the you front can now do it you guess you can now check your calibration at the end which you yeah. couldn't before you basically had to sort of trust it was okay yeah and and you know again neil said you know with mathematics because that's all it is it just works out with maths and it should have been fine but yeah now you can go and you can check it for sure and share your graphs and so on uh, i forgot to say with panasonic side of things as well you can now um do double vision, vision. vision uh, calibration right. which you can't do so yeah some of changes there. Um, right, so that's the OLED stuff out of the way. Let's go to Samsung uh, just to wrap this up because I think we've discussed everything else really. Um, so I've got to say, uh, you know, you got to see yes, and especially in years like like this year where not a lot happens, there's not a lot of things moving along. I think Samsung had probably the nicest looking TV I've seen in a long time. And when you see as many TVs as I, <laughs> myself and Steve in a year. There's not a lot you can do with TV designs, really. I mean, you could go really far out, like what Philips did with with their, you know, the stand with the tweeter built into the stand and stuff, and you know, make that. And and that was a beautiful looking TV with the Bowers and Wilkins and soundbar and that kind of thing. You get the odd product like that, but in terms of just a, a, a mass market TV, what they've done with the Q950 TS is amazing in terms of design. It is a beautiful looking TV. It really is uh, one of the best TVs I've seen for a while. It's still got a bezel. <laughs> they might say it's bezel-less. Um, it's, it's still got a tiny bezel there. But in terms of looks... It yeah, because it, something's got to hold it Exactly. The Some, together, something's got to it? hold it together. But the way they've designed it, it does look really, really nice. Um, and uh, when I was in the innovation room as well, um, which, again, is a closed-door thing, no photographs, that kind of thing. But... Um, and this is the stuff that you were showing when you were over with them uh, back in November, Steve. So a lot of the stuff you saw, it was my opportunity to see it because that's what they do in the, the innovation room, although they didn't show absolutely everything. Um, they had it up against the BVM uh, X310, which is the new Sony um, LCD mastering monitor. The very, very few. Uh, Florin had to take his own. It was his own TV uh, master monitor that he, he let Samsung use for the demo. Uh, pff- the closest TV I've seen, to be honest, um, to looking identical to the to the master monitor, it was it was really impressive. I don't know what calibration they did to it. They said it was out of the box, so you can only <laughs> so you can only take them on what they tell yeah, you. I mean, if they tell you that, then you have to take them at their word. You have to mean. take them at their word. Um, obviously, no, I'm, it's I'm, easy to check when you get a review sample, isn't it? <laughs> It is, but where are we going to get an X310 from? I'll, I'll have to... I'll have to oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll have to yeah, ask. Yeah, I mean, you can measure it, can't you, and see how... Uh... Yeah, of course, of course you can. You can measure these things. And, and you know... Um, it, but that was... For me, that was the most impressive thing I saw uh, there from, from this new TV was just, just how close it was getting. Um, in terms of the material that had been shown, because I know people will be interested in this, there wasn't any dark star fields or anything like that, so... Uh, yeah, so uh, in terms of the innovation room and that kind of thing, some interesting stuff. I've got to say, the, uh, it's a beautiful looking TV and what I've seen so far are the picture quality. And again, I didn't see anything that was difficult. It is a fantastic oh, looking TV. Yeah. And, and I love the way that they built the, the, the speakers into it. It's it's a really well, they really thought it through quite nicely. Yeah, but my um, understanding is though, it's uh, it's their own audio processor. So it's oh not, yeah, no, no, it's not, um, it's bizarre. I mean, whilst I can understand the, the corporate, thinking behind LG not being too keen to to use HDR10 plus because it's essentially a Samsung initiative. I don't understand Samsung reticence to employ Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos in their TVs. They work with Dolby in, on Atmos for their soundbars. It's it's a third party. It's got no connection to LG. Uh, and yet they the number of times I've told them that, 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 why don't you just put it in? I don't understand. Because, I mean, whereas HDR10 plus isn't actually used that much in terms of there's only a few discs and, and a bit of stuff on 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 Amazon. There's a load of Atmos. I'm yep. sorry. There's a load of Vision stuff now. I mean, it's Netflix. Yep. It's well, Disney I asked Plus, the question. I did, I did ask the question, and again, you got to take people on the on the replies. And the reply was that um, they didn't see the need for Vision because uh, their TVs are all all of the high end TVs are over a thousand nits. Some of them pushing over two thousand nits. So um, they didn't see the value in Dolby Vision. They they only see the value in Dolby Vision on TVs that struggle to 
with dynamic range and to reach peak brightness um, where dynamic metadata is useful um, and that was the answer that was given um, to that question and I wasn't the only person that was asking them that so and again you've got to take them on what they say sure. but, but that I don't was, understand why they put upward firing drivers into their TVs and then don't employ Atmos yeah and th that one is, that one is a bit strange especially when the same bars do it you know what I mean yeah. so um, so yeah but I, again they, they did a couple of audio demonstrations and the audio does sound really quite good I'm, I'm interested to, to I'm really interested to have a play about with these TVs this year because I think uh, it's going to be interesting so the Q950TS is definitely coming the Q800 series is definitely coming yeah. q900 there's a question mark over that they're not they haven't made any decision so far on the q900s whether we're going to get that in the uk or not um but they said they would update us in, t in terms of that kind of thing um when they announced their 4k tvs which is going to be later this this year i'd imagine that's going to be in the next month or two um that we'll get the full yeah yeah well, I, so. i'm gonna guess february yeah, uh, that's what they normally do. Sometime in February, they'll have an event somewhere in Europe yeah. or, or UK and announce the rest of the lineup. I mean, the, the point is the Q950TS is the flagship. It's got everything, everything, every new feature, object tracking, sound plus, where the sound's meant to track the objects on the screen uh, more precisely than just panning from left to right. Yeah. Um, it's got a 4.222 channel speakers, so it's got two subs built into the back. It's got two speakers at the bottom, two speakers halfway up, two at the top. Um, got the new quantum processor. You're just showing off because you've you've seen this TV and you've played about with <laughs> neural it, network so. processing. Uh, oh, uh, my favourite feature though um, is the digital butler. <laughs> well, I'm not uh, totally sold on the name, but uh, what it basically does is it scans your networks in the area around your TV and just finds every device imaginable. Then you can just connect them all to your TV if you want to. As, long, cool. as long as they're your devices. Obviously, you don't want your uh, neighbour's device. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Imagine in a terrorist house, there'd be about <laughs> 5,000 things it's picking up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so Steve got an early look at, at, at the, the TV. It was a pre-production, but you did get a, an early yeah, look. Yeah, um, number of zones is the same as last year, yeah. so 488 from memory. Um, and... Yeah, it, it's it's a it's it looked in terms of picture quality, it looked impressive. In terms of design, it's absolutely gorgeous, um, and that will be the flagship. So the eight hundred will be very similar. Um, not, I don't think quite as many zones is the main difference, and not maybe not quite as pretty. But most of the other features will also be on the eight hundred. Um, yeah. These obviously are eight K TVs uh, and HDMI two point one, of course, as well. Um, yeah. and at least one input. And Steve's hands hands on write up is is on the homepage as well. If you want a little bit more detail on yeah. that TV, and that's an actual hands on. Steve actually got his hands on I, that I TV. Have my hands on that all and, over, and he, and he got to play about <laughs> with it. Not not like these hands on reviews that have popped up on other websites this week from CES, where people are writing reviews from the show floor where it's playing. Material that is designed yeah, to that, make the that's, 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 a, bit, that's yeah. a bit disingenuous, I yeah. think. But uh, uh, this is is, I spent time with this TV and I had the engineers t going through the features and everything, so it's it, it was fairly in depth, you know, two days worth of time with, with largely with this television and other things too. But I mean, I didn't actually get a chance, interestingly, I didn't get a chance to see the micro LED TVs, but you did, so. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, so um, I, I I know I said in my video and and and, and so on that it wasn't showing Hollywood material. And somebody pointed out that Hobbs and Shaw was on screen in one of the video shots. Uh, that was processed. That was part of a um, a loop that was going round, which um, it didn't look like. <laughs> Hobbs and Shaw should look like uh, it was different clips all added in you know like a, like a show reel type thing mm. and it had obviously been processed which is why I said I didn't see any Hollywood material as in I didn't see anything playing from a disc player or whatever on the screen that, that I'm familiar with that's what I meant when I said that I didn't mean that Hobbs and Shaw wasn't shown it was it was just it was processed like and it didn't look particularly good to be honest um, in terms of micro LED right so there was nothing shown on the screens that would would be normal content so it's very very difficult which is why I don't write hands on reviews of things on a show floor <laughs> um, I, I, I can't believe it. this has really annoyed me but there's certain sites like what you know this and that and um, <laughs> you know who I'm talking about they've all got hands on reviews and they've all seen the same things I've seen I, I, I couldn't live with myself writing a review about something like that and, and assessing picture quality you can write about how nice the frame looks and well, the features the design and what features it come with and so on do that as a preview that's what we do we do as a preview we don't put anything in there about picture quality because you can't assess picture quality it's not like you've spent two days with that TV Steve so you can talk about picture quality because you got to yeah. put things on that that you're familiar with that you know and you could see what the performance was like. You know, these are things that are on a show floor. So I really, I wish journalists would stop doing that. 
um, because I, I don't think it serves anything other than getting you ranking on a, a you know Google no, or that's whatever. <laughs> that's that's the only reason you guys do it. Please stop doing it because you know it it confuses people. It gets people excited or overexcited because they think it's, and and you're not basing it on any performance parameters whatsoever. Stop doing it, people. It, it's not doing the industry any good doing that. Anyway, I'll get off my my soapbox. <laughs> uh, what was I talking about? Uh, yeah, microelectronics. Like <laughs> right. Uh, I am still convinced this this is a a future technology. I'm not saying it's the future technology. I'm saying it is a future technology because we don't know what's around the corner. Somebody might invent something tomorrow. That absolutely the same as OLED. You know, Beam OLED it right into your brain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, OLED was the future until 4K HDR came along. You know, that's what that's what made life yeah, difficult then, then for it, OLED. Yeah, a brick wall. To be yeah. Honest. yeah, that that's what that's you know. And, and OLED has to overcome that, um, and, and it's it's what you know. 4K killed off plasma because to to produce a plasma screen with with that yeah. many pixels. 4K killed off plasma, and HDR has limited, limited OLED, OLED to a thousand yeah. nits effectively. Yeah. So so we need something else. Is that going to be dual layer LCD tech? It's that's really promising from a cost point of view. If you think you know how many LCD All panels those struggles are, with the brightness again. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's still a lot brighter than OLED. So and and you know that's what the Dolby Pulsar is. You know the Dolby Pulsar is. Oh, a, that's true. Yeah, that's true. What's know, that get to? It's a dual layer, and that's a four thousand nit display. Yeah, it's 4, nits. Um, so that's a possibility. You know, um, you have mini LED. That's all going to come down to how well the the dimming algorithms work and so on, and whether they can take advantage of that. And then you have micro LED, which is a proper self-emissive technology. Um, and that this is the key thing. Um, it has the brightness and it has the ultimate black levels um, and the viewing angles. It also has viewing angles. It's incredibly slim. Um, it's modular in design, which could be a pitfall of the technology. It depends on how well you can match each of the panels up. We've all seen the BBC uh, news um, weather video wall thing where <laughs> it's not really calibrated very well. I mean, it, it won't be as bad as that, but you might have shifts in white balance or slight issues. You might have issues with the pixel edges where the two yeah, meet Yeah, it'd be together interesting to see so a full field grey pattern on yeah. <laughs> one of those TVs, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. And again... Like 5% this, or something or a 10% grey pattern. On yeah, I, which, which again, you know, um, hopefully, fingers crossed, we will get hold of one this year um, in, in some form or another. I, I am hopeful... Yeah, the seventy-five inch. Um, because th- just to make it clear, what they now what they launched, um, there was uh, a number of different screen sizes, but the seventy-five, the eighty-eight, and the ninety-three inches micro LED TVs, those are going to be fixed screen TVs. I think they're still composed of modules, and you got a closer look at them. So did you see on the small the- on the smaller screens? I couldn't see a thing on no. the on the on the big massive two hundred and ninety-two. Now two hundred and ninety-two inches. Right, you think oh, oh, that's big until you're standing next to one. That's like the side of a house. It's like the ga- yes, it's gable enormous. gable end of a house. You know, that's how big a screen you're talking about. Yeah. and the heat. <laughs> oh, they put off some heat. Don't oh, they? the heat. You know, if you, if you're struggling to warm up your room in the winter, my God, get yourself a micro LED wall. It'll only cost you a few million, but you know, it'll be worth yeah. it for the heat. That, yeah, yeah, that's something they're going to have to take care of as well. Um, but yeah. It, it, when I got up close to them, the the smaller screen sizes, I really couldn't see anything. But again, it, you know, it, like I say, I couldn't put a gla- grace slide on, um, and it was plain material that I'm not familiar with. So, mm. with the material that it had on there, did it have a bezel? How was it? What was it? I mean, did it look like a TV? I suppose is the question I'm asking. Yes, it looked like a TV. Um, no, it, it didn't have any bezel, but obviously it has to contain itself. So, you know, there is a, a, an outer. It's a bit like a OLED, you know, with a one millimeter strip yeah. around. Um, but my god, are they bright! And they had a QLED sitting next to one. Um, and, and when I mean bright, I mean dynamic range bright. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, from black to white, um, it, it's it's three times the brightness of a QLED. Now, a QLED, um, I, I don't know exactly which one it is, but if it was a if it's a recent top of the range QLED, you're talking two thousand nits, up to two thousand nits. Um, it's possibly a, a bit more than that, but I'm going to be conservative and say 2,000 nits on, on the QLED. The, this micro LED next to it was absolutely murdering it in terms of brightness. And it was doing that with the correct colours. Um, so it wasn't like um, pushing the colour volume in any way. It, it looked natural. Um, again, there was a lack of skin tones. There was a lack of any um, colours that, that we know from memory. 
um, which made things a little bit difficult to do a proper assessment, which is why I'm really hopeful that we do get uh, a 75 in, whether you get hold of one or whether we have to go somewhere to look at it and, and but get a proper hands-on with one, because I have so many questions after seeing that on the show floor. It looks mightily impressive, but my concern is, again, that, that there might be some smoke and mirrors here because it was CES. And I don't mean that, that Samsung's being disingenuous, I just mean it's a show, you know, and, and they have to they have to give you something to look at and I'm wondering and the reason I say that is that I remember I don't remember if it was you uh, that was with me or if it, if it was David McKenzie but it was when Pioneer folded and it was the first line of, of Panasonic um, plasmas and I remember walking into the demo room and I thought that's a, that's a Pioneer Kuro um, the Panasonic screen because it looked so much like my 5090 and then, it was a Pioneer Kuro <laughs> and then when it came to the show floor at the uh, at the convention, like a month later, it was a completely different TV, <laughs> yeah. completely different picture. So I'm not saying that that's what Samsung's doing. All I'm saying is that um, you know it's CES. You want to big up your models. You want to big up what's what's coming this year, and you're going to show them in the best way that you think is 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 to show them. It's certainly not the way I would want to see a product. But then the way that myself and Steve want to see products is is accurate, and that doesn't excite people in the same yeah. kind of way. Uh, that's kind of what I'm trying to get across. Right, so... Sorry, just quickly, just to finish, so 75, 88, 93 inches, those are the fixed screen sizes, and then there's the the wall option, which is modular, uh, as in it's assembled for a specific space, but that came in, in 110, 150, and, and the one you mentioned, the 292 inch screen sizes. Um, the 75, 88, and 93, and 110s were all eight, uh, 4K resolution, and the 150 and 292 are 8K resolution. Now, a friend of mine said to me, well, if they're made of modules, each module's got a fixed resolution. So yeah. I, I'm, my interpretation of this is, and it's just my interpretation based upon what I've been told and, and logic, is that the 75-inch, I'm assuming that's native 4K. My guess would be the 8893 are high, and, and 110 have a resolution that's more than 4K, but not as high as 8K, and therefore they can't show 8K natively. And then the 150 is probably 8K natively, and the 292 is higher than 8K. But again, you know, it's going to scale everything to 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 its actual resolution, because yeah. that's the only thing that makes any sense if you're using a fixed yeah. Yeah, cause, resolution. Because what you're not going to do, yeah, it has to be cost effectively. It has to be the same resolution for each each module. So each module has to be a certain resolution, and then when you add them together. It has to give yeah. you a final. It also resolution. means that they couldn't make a 4K TV smaller than 75 inches, presumably. Uh, although, for those who've been asking for 65 and that sort of stuff, I mean, if you've only got a finite number of, you know, a, a fixed resolution for the modules you're using to compare, they're using the same modules for everything. That's because that, that's another big. Definitely, the the new micro LED TVs, they're using new modules with smaller uh, LED chipsets than the original walls that were being shown a year ago or two years ago. So, there are changes happening. Yeah, but, this, this, um, is, this is all propriety stuff, and, and we, you're not going to get the answer to no. it from, from them directly. But I think the point so. Samson wants to make is is that uh, by using a modular approach, particularly when very large screen sizes, the ones that fill an entire wall, you can basically use any any ratio, aspect ratio you want. So if yeah. you want to use scope ratio, oh, you can do it's that. It's not just, not just on the big screens, but they also had demonstrations where they had vertical screens for yeah. obviously um, professional use, you know, signage and that kind of thing. You can have a single module as a picture frame. Um, like you know the old digital picture frames that you used to get you know that technology that was out a few years ago you shoved an SD card in and it, it rotated through your, your photos um, they had something similar to that on the, on the, one of the walls um, showing that off so you can go from really small to, to really big um, but yeah coming back to your you know how what's the resolution of each module it could be that they use a controller as well Steve because if you're thinking about how many oh, yeah yeah they, 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 I mean they, they're applying as controllers in terms of controlling the how, how many pixels are actually fired to make up the, the Possibly, image yeah, yeah. yeah. there, there yeah. could be all sorts yeah. of tricks going on there's a lot of scaling so. going on and there's AI yeah. applications uh, and obviously so I mean the, so it, but it's interesting I mean like I said I think last year or even the year before when they first launched this or, or showed it to us um, you know theoretically it, it, assuming they can get the cost down and I'm guessing if you have to keep making if all your manufacturing is the same module every time you should be able to get the cost down relatively quickly because yeah. it's economies of scale, right? You're just making the same thing over and over again. You're not doing different screen sizes. So if you can get that price down, 
and it works and you can get it you know, then then it could be it could completely change how we think about television because it, it would it just be do. make make one that wall the size of that wall yeah <laughs> but but then you got to look at the tolerances of your manufacturer because these all have to match in terms of white balance yes, and everything else. and obviously the, when you're dealing with tiny, I mean, mic, microscopic LED, well, microscopic pixels, yeah. each composed of three microscopic LEDs, you know, making them is apparently very, very difficult at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this technology is going to come. This, uh, ladies and gentlemen, was supposed to be a 30-minute podcast. Yeah. We're, we're currently running... I thought you were optimistic. <laughs> yeah, we're currently almost at three times that. So uh, you're getting your value for money as well. Anyway, um, so we run to the final two... Uh, subjects we wanted to talk about anyway um, one of them is very close to what we do that's filmmaker mode it's basically picture perfect but in a but in a button press or an API signal or a flag in your content and it's really really simple and I think people certainly when I've read comments um, on YouTube and on the forums and so on um, I think people are over complicating this uh, what it actually is and, and what it's supposed to be it's basically a picture preset where it switches everything off that needs to be switched off and it puts the TV in the most accurate mode for that TV out of the box. It's not a calibrated mode. Um, it does nothing other than it switches everything off that needs to be switched off. So edge enhancement, um, your motion smoothing, um, frame interpolation. Um, it's making sure it's in the correct color space. It's making sure that it's in the most accurate picture mode. Um, and it's got the correct grayscale setting, and and, and that's it. Nits and the brightness for SDR. At least at least hundred nits for for SDR. Um, and it's making sure it does that for SDR and HDR content. That's all it does. And it's not for you. It's not for AV forums members. It's not for people like me and Steve. This is for the general public. Um, people who want to switch off the motion motion smoothing, but don't want to go through six layers of menus to find it. Um, or switch off edge enhancement and not know what it's called on a particular TV. Because let's face it, does not, each manufacturer has their own names for whatever it is that, that that technology does. And if you're talking about something like Philips, I love Philips, but if you're talking about something like Philips, you've got huge menu systems. It's all called perfect, perfect pixel, whatever. And so it gets really, really confusing if you're a, a general member of the public. Filmmaker mode is one button or it uses metadata and it puts up a flag on the TV and it says, the content you're watching is a movie, would you like to watch it in the filmmaker mode or not? And there's also an option to say, don't show me this message again. So if it's of no interest to you whatsoever, you click no and then you click on, do not show me this message again. And that's it. You'll never see anything from Filmmaker Mode again. And if you want Filmmaker Mode, you can go into the menus, click on Picture Preset, and it'll be listed in there. And it'll be listed in all capitals on Cap Lock, because that's another thing that uh, Filmmaker Mode insists on. That if it's in a menu system, it's all uppercase. That's why in the shots that you've seen from CES, it's all uppercase. And it just makes it easier on the eye to find it quicker. That's the whole reasoning behind that. Nothing, nothing other than it's easier to spot amongst cinema and true cinema and standard and dynamic it's easier to see everything it's in in all capitals and that's it that's all it does it's all it's intended to do the thing is it's got huge backing from hollywood um not just film directors but cinematographers and colorists and dops and you know the whole industry is behind this because at the end of the day they just want you to watch their content as it's supposed to be and the beauty of this mode, and Steve will back me up on this, is that we started Picture Perfect 2011, yeah, 2012, and getting manufacturers to agree to just putting their logo against something and saying our TVs have a cinema mode was really, really difficult. It took forever to get Samsung on board. It took forever to get other manufacturers on board. Um, and the way that we had to explain it was, look, we're not talking about who's best or who does things better. It just, it's just a list of the settings to put into the TV to make sure that it's in uh, a mode that shows content as the creator intended. And, and the big thing here is, um, and we've alluded to it throughout the podcast, is like these manufacturers like to do their own things and Samsung like to do their own things. The fact that Samsung are behind this... Staggered. Is, yeah, and, and off camera... I mean, I was no surprise that Panasonic were first. Yeah. And LG were straight on board. Yeah. And, and then, and then Vizio. Vizio. And so. 
But yeah. then Pan Philips and Panas and sorry, Philips and Samsung yeah. were both a bit of a surprise, actually. Yeah, but you know, um, off camera, I, I spoke to Mike and I said, "Well done, congratulations!" And he said, "Look, it was hard work, but at the end of the day, we're not talking about who's best or whose product. It's just to help the consumer at the end of the day, and you can't argue against that. So if you're a big global." You know, corporations like Samsung, you can't argue about how to get the best out of your product, really. So, um, but yeah, well done to Mike for getting them all together. I'm sure his team worked really, really hard. Everyone but Sony. Um, everyone but Sony. And and um, when asked the question, Sony said, "Well, our custom mode does all that." So I think they missed. Yeah, they, the, they're missing the point, aren't they? they yeah, they missed the TV's point. He's got a, yeah. a, a mode that does that basically. If it's ISF dark or bright on an LG, or if it's you know the same on a Panasonic, or if it's the movie mode on a Samsung, they're all basically doing exactly what you've just said that they need to do. But yeah. the problem is the consumer doesn't understand the difference or can't find them. Yeah. So having one mode on every manufacturer's TV with the same name that says what it does on the tin and has a dedicated button on the remote control or in the case of LG. Now, actually, this is a question I wanted to ask you. So how is LG implementing this? <laughs> uh, it's done by metadata or, or flags within the content. So the content's always had the flags. It, it's been there since the the dawn of the disc, basically. Do you remember THX Director? Yeah, Directors. Media um, Director. Media Director. It was the same thing. It was just used the flag in the content to switch the TV into certain things. It's a little bit more advanced now. But um, an HDMI signal has certain things in there, and there's always been a cinema flag in there for cinema content. Uh, and there's other things that they can do using AI. So if it's uh, 24 frames per second material, I think it's a fair guess to say that that's film content. Mm -hmm. um, so if the TV, you know, it, it matches that. If there's not a flag telling it's a movie, but it's, it realizes it's 24 frames per second, it will it will display the the thing on screen saying, uh, "We think you're watching a movie. Do you want to watch it in filmmaker mode?" And that's all it does. It just puts this in on the LGs. It just puts this screen thing up. Pop and you up, can turn that off as well if you don't want to. Use yeah, it. like I say, you can select "Do not show me this again," and it'll never show you it again. Or you can say no, and then the next time it detects a, a movie, um, it will display the same thing. Presumably, you could also manually select film mode if you wanted to use it. Yes, anyway. you can go in the menus, and like I say, it's all in uppercase in the picture presets. It's uppercase film maker mode, so it's easy to spot quickly, and you can select it that way. Or like Panasonic. Panasonic have a button on the remote control. So, so manufacturers have two choices, use metadata or use a physical button on the remote control. Panasonic went the physical button. LG have gone with the uh, the metadata approach or uh, the TV AI. I bet, I bet you Samsung go with the metadata approach as well. Probably. Um, but it, it's, and going forward, there, there will be a dedicated flag in content because it's, it's nice and simple to add. Um, so discs being manufactured going forwards and, and um, streaming services will be given um, certain things as well that they can display when, when the content gets shown and it'll pop it up. Um, but like I say, you know, the AI is also advanced because you know, the question was asked a few times, well, the metadata doesn't exist at the minute. And it's like, well, you know, the AI can sort things out like, is it 24 frames per second? Um, is it cinema scope? That kind of thing. It, you know, it's something that, that the TV can check quickly and then say, we think this is a movie, do you want filmmaker mode? Uh, but like I say, it's there for, not, it's not there for us, it's not there for AV Forums members. It's there for your auntie uh, or your granny or whatever, and they're watching a film and they decide they want to see it in the best picture mode possible. They have the option, they have the choice. And I want to come back to that as well. It's, it's all about choice. If you want to watch it in vivid mode um, and colours pumped up and all the rest of it, be our guest. Nobody's going to say you're wrong. Um, nobody's going to say you can't do that. Well, I'm going to say you're wrong, but you can yeah, do yeah. it. <laughs> But at the end of the day, it's a, it's about you know having the choice to do it, and the technology is there now to do it. You know, uh, Media Director was ahead of its time, I think, from THX. It was a great idea. It's just it was so so advanced and so ahead of its time that they, they didn't get any traction with it, and it and it kind of died. But it, again, it was a great idea. It was using metadata to tell the TV what the content was and the TV to set itself up. And the other thing that works is that and um, as a professional calibrator. <laughs> I feel sorry for Steve, but TVs are getting really, really accurate out of the box now. You're going to have panel variance. Calibration will always get, get rid of that variance and it'll always give you the absolute best. But for for the mass market, TVs are now getting so accurate out of the box to within delta ease of maximums of five and six. <laughs> which I wish it was that bad. <laughs> I know. It's, I, I, I measured the 77-inch C9 last night. 
<laughs> average del- uh, well no del trees were all below one yeah yeah out of the box yeah i mean you're going to have some panel views the reason i said five or six is that that's still really 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 acceptable um you're going to see maybe a, a yellow cast or whatever um depending on what errors you get but you know anything under four is exceptional anything under three is is absolutely bang on the money um and and we're getting to that you know you're getting to that point now where you're getting that performance out of the box and you you have to think of calibration is more than and calibration is more than just picture it's it's all about the video chain it's all about the environment that you're using the tv in so you can't forget things like that if you stick a tv on a on a red color wall you're going to have issues even if that tv's accurate out of the box cuz the color around the tv is now affecting how you see color basically um so calibration definitely still has its place um i was jesting a little bit with steve there so don't write off calibration at all because it's more than just you know setting the tv up correctly it's all about the environment it's all about the video chain it's all about making sure everything's doing things properly but if you just want your tv to look as natural as possible out of the box they do it now and filmmaker mode is going to help the the wider audience do that now the last subject a bit more controversial um actually there's two last subjects the other one i wanted to discuss was atmos uh music Dolby Atmos music um I had my doubts about this went into a demo uh, the demo was using an AVR and a full range Atmos system no no high speakers it was using um uh floor standards with the Dolby Atmos uh, upward firing speakers so it was bouncing it off the ceiling uh, they didn't have ceiling speakers full system and uh, I listened to LL Cool J uh, first of all it was um, I'm Gonna Knock You Out <laughs> sorry I forgot what it was there um, it was a reimagining with uh, strings and all the rest of it and, and it was quite impressive I thought oh yeah that's that's different I mean it's nothing I haven't heard before with uh, multi-channel music before but you know it was interesting uh, then they played Prince When Doves Cry <laughs> um, oh my god what an emotional experience that was I've never heard anything like, and I'm not bigging this up in any way or whatever. Um, and and music is it's a it's a media that that we consume, but it's also probably the only media where you could hear the first four bars of a song and instantly you're you're back somewhere, or you can smell uh, a, a certain perfume, or you know it's it, it brings back memories. That's what I'm trying to get at, and and it can be an emotional experience. And hearing that, and hearing it being um, presented in such a way that it, it was just something really, really special. Um, I don't know if it was this song or or what, but um, it was really, really amazing. And then what killed it was the fact that it's only available on Tidal and Amazon Music, and it's only available through a smart speaker or through headphones on a mobile phone, which I'm like, you what? <laughs> I've just had one of the most emotional experiences I've had with music in a long, long time through a full system using an AVR and a full Atmos system and you're telling me it only works on a tiny little smart speaker which I had the demo with the smart speaker and yeah, fair enough for a smart speaker it was really good it, it, you know, you had a nice wide expansive sound field but it was nothing like the experience I'd just had with the physical Atmos system with the full full range speakers and everything else in, in a room and and I didn't understand the approach to that. Maybe it's a generational thing. Maybe that is how people are consuming music. I just thought, what a waste! Mm-hmm. That that I can't get that. I can't go home and and fire up Tidal through my Atmos Denon eighty five hundred and my MK speakers and have that same experience at home. I couldn't do that. That's I didn't understand the thinking there, and I I, I really want to speak to Dolby and try and get a bit more about this because my understanding is it works on an app based system so I don't think there'd be much in the way of stopping a company such as and I'm being hypothetical here I know no information uh, that this is the case this is just me and my opinion but maybe a company like Denon and Marantz who do the HEOS stuff I'm wondering if that's maybe a way of delivering it Mm. Um, maybe through a manufacturer like that I don't know, I need to speak to Dolby more my intention is to speak to Dolby more and try and get them maybe on the podcast as well because I think we need to discuss Vision IQ as well which we're going to come on to now so Dolby Vision, um, Dolby Atmos Music 
from the, the the demo in the big system, I am I was almost blubbing. You know, it, it was it was astonishingly good. And and they're going back to the masters. So this is not an algorithm. It's not sending a stereo signal in and then trying to guess where things are. Um, Dolby Atmos is an object based system. It goes back into the studio. They use the original stems from the original recordings and they remix it and they remix it using objects and so on. And it's it's not. It's not like um, what we've seen in the past where you, you have like a bass guitar behind your left, right, and a cymbal behind your left ear or whatever. It's it's a, it's a lot more um, enveloping than that, and it's it's not as gimmicky. It's not a gimmick. It's it's actually a new way of pre- presenting music, I think. And like I say, I mean, it had a real reaction with me, so well worth it. Right, let's move on to Vision because we're way over time. Um, Dolby Vision IQ. So it's no different to Dolby Vision. They're, they're not changing anything in terms of uh, how the film is graded um, or the information that is uh, possessed within the metadata. It's all there. So uh, in a particular screen, um, the TV is told what red should look like and it will try its best within its capabilities to display red at that intensity um, that the, the, the code said in the metadata that red should look like that. Uh, same with black level, same with shadow detail. Um, I think this is the easiest way to explain it. So it's all there. It tells the TV what it should do, uh, normal Dolby Vision, and that's what the, the TV does. And it does it on a frame by frame or a scene by scene basis. Where IQ is different is that it uses the um, uh, sensor in the TV um, to measure the ambient light in the room and then adjust the picture for that ambient light. This is not new technology. This has been around for a long time and it's always looked naff. It's always looked really, really bad because a light sensor, it, all it does is it lifts a gamma. <laughs> that's that's what it's done in the past. It's up the brightness and it's lifted the gamma. This is not that. Dolby Vision IQ is not that. So if that's your recollection of how a light sensor works, scrap it completely. Um, this does it properly and it does it properly. And And, and what I mean by properly is it's all there in the metadata, what the image should look like. Um, so all the sensor is doing is applying that, but applying it at a brighter level. So it's it's reading that the room has uh, light in it, and it's subtly lifting areas of the image that it thinks needs to be lifted to retain what it should look like, but at a slightly higher level than, um, than you would in, in Dolby Vision Dark. So it does in a way try its very best to keep the director's intent and it's really subtle which is what surprised me. So when I saw the demo which was on the uh, Panasonic uh, behind closed doors um, room um, and I got to play about with it um, I got hands on with it I got my phone out and I, I switched the torch on <laughs> and put the torch up against the <laughs> The, uh, the the sensor just to see if I could trick it and no it it brightened it up a little bit but it didn't bright it in, brighten it in such a way that it then looked milky and no contrast you know what I mean um, it kept its dynamic uh, look it kept its the the the, the gamma looked right um, and and even with uh, in a dark room. And they couldn't get a completely dark room where we were, so there was a little bit of light. So even with the lights off, the Dolby IQ version was just a shade brighter than the the Dolby Division Dark on the GZ2000. So the the HZ was it had a little bit more in the shadows. It was lifting things just a slightly more to the environment because there was a little bit of ambient light there. And then when the full lights came on. It was it was quite a bit of difference because you know as soon as you have any ambient light on it kills um, the look because it opens your iris and and that's what you're talking about you're talking about your eye and how your eye is is taking this information and in. it was something I could not capture on the camera uh, because the camera's limited dynamic range and you have to set the ISO for different levels and all the rest of it so there was no way between lights on lights off I could get it looking the way that I could see it with my own eyes um, and, and I've got to say I didn't hate the technology I wanted to because it goes against most of the principles that that as a video file yeah, I we think, have I think it's, it's, you're absolutely right Phil in the past 
when they've implemented this kind of technology using a light sensor, it's been very crude. It's just jacked the uh, gamma, basically, yeah. uh, when, whenever there's been brightness in the room. This is a much more sophisticated approach. And, and it, it, I, I do get the, the thinking behind it because if you're watching Dolby Vision content in the Dolby Vision cinema mode on, the, on your TV, that's the accurate mode. That's the mode designed to replicate how it would have looked in a mastering suite. But the mastering suite would have been blacked out, maybe some bias lights behind the monitor. That's not how most people watch TV. I mean, it's how I watch TV. It's how you yeah, watch TV. Yeah. But it ain't how most people. Most people watch TV in rooms with quite a lot of ambient light in them, even at night time. Uh, and I've heard plenty of people say to me, like, Dolby Vision looks really, oh, and HDR, not just Dolby Vision, HDR 10 as well, looks really dim. Um, I can't really see in the dark scenes. It's too dark. Uh, and in a brightly lit room, that is absolutely true. So they're trying to um, use the metadata, dynamic metadata that's already in the content yeah, yeah. and the light sensor in combination to give you an experience that retains is, the content yeah. content creators intentioned whilst also allowing for the fact you ain't watching it in a black room <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it comes with that caveat okay um it's getting as close as possible and you have to bear that in mind so i've read the comments um a lot of the comments you know slagging this off saying it's a waste of time and, and all the rest all say is give it a chance um you know, nobody's like filmmaker mode. Nobody's holding a gun to your head and saying you will use this mode and and, and all the rest of it. I, I was really skeptical, and I actually thought, you know what, this has been done in such a way that it's making sensible use of technology that's there to try and better the experience for the majority of people, and at the same time, trying its hardest to keep the intent of the original material and the thing is as soon as you move away from watching in a dim room which not a lot of people do um to anything other than that the you know common sense is you need the picture to match the environment um again this is graded in a in a grading suite it's supposed to be shown in a cinema they, they can control those environments the the creatives can control those environments so each grading room is usually lit the same way to the same sort of brightness, and certainly the monitors being used, whether it's Dolby Digital, or, uh, uh, sorry, whether it's Dolby Vision at four thousand nits, um, other stuff at a thousand nits, and then SDR at hundred uh, nits, they can control that, and they control that in the cinema as well. So they have control of that. Where they don't have control is your TV in your room in your environment, um, which is why we have professional calibrators, which is why we have accurate modes and all the rest of it. But like you say, Steve, the vast majority of people. They, they don't have that kind of control and if the TV can do something that presents the content um, in a way that, that doesn't destroy it so shoving it in vivid mode or, st or shoving it in standard mode destroys the intent and what we mean by that is that the, there are subtle cues within films and within film material where directors try and evoke emotional responses from you or they try and set you in a scene so the matrix is green there's a green tinge when you're in the matrix. When you're not, it's blue. Um, that's that's you know the, the common used reference, but but that's true. But there's other things. There's like a horror movie. You'll always have cool looking colours, muted colours in a horror movie where the blood is actually bright red, um, but everything else is muted. Or you have um, Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds where everything is so desaturated. But that's the intended look. Or James Cameron goes for a, kind or, of a steely blue yeah. uh, photography, particularly at night times, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, Terminator, Terminator 2 is a great example of that, mm. you know, where, he, where he's using blue light within. And again, it sets emotional responses. And that's what we mean by intent um, and, and creator's intent, because they're trying to evoke emotional response in you, either subtly or, or, or fairly obvious with red blood splattering all over and, and they want that more intense or whatever. Um so yeah, at the end of the day, you want to see the material as close as possible to that. Um, if you're in li normal living room or whatever, this helps. And it does it in a way that it's not a gimmick. Um, like we've said, it reads the metadata. It knows what you know what the coordinates are for that particular red or green or yellow. And it's going to try and hit that and hit it at a brightness level that, that, that looks right for your room. And again, this is subtle. And, and and I need to get that across. So if you go into a demo of this and you think, well, there wasn't a great deal of brightness, that's kind of the <laughs> point. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not going to suddenly be torch level brightness. It's just going to lift things subtly uh, and in a way that create, keeps the intent, but but you can see stuff. 
It's like that Game of Thrones episode. I don't know what one it was. I never saw it. I... Uh, the third, yeah, the long um, night. If you want an example of what it does, and you've already got a TV that's got Dolby Vision, just select the Dolby Vision Home. So there's Dolby Vision Cinema and Dolby Vision Cinema Home. Or Bright. Dolby Vision Cinema Home, or sometimes it's yeah, maybe called Bright and some of them. But that's designed to lift it for a brighter environment. So it's essentially going to be the centre that goes between those two modes, basically. Yeah, it's it's um, it's around that. So, and it and it does it on a frame by frame, scene by scene basis. So. Um, if you're suddenly in a dark scene, it's not suddenly just going to be completely black. You are going to be able to see what's going on within the, within that scene. And the the motivation was that scene of uh, Game of Thrones. Actually, that's why I mentioned it <laughs> at the uh, Panasonic press um, thing. That that's what they said. They said, "Look, this is an issue. How do we solve it?" And and that that's what you know gave them. The I have idea. that. Uh, I have that on 4K disc actually. Um, that season uh, in Dolby Vision. So it would be quite a good test. <laughs> yeah, it will. It will. Right, so for a 30 uh, minutes... Sorry, there's one, one thing then, one final thing then, which is that obviously Dolby Vision IQ is being implemented by LG and Panasonic. Panasonic are also implementing their own version of filmmaker mode with... Yes. Yes, uh, and, what are they called? Intelligent sensor, is that intelligent right? Intelligent sensor. sensor. So it's, it's yeah. exactly the same thing, but that's for HDR10, HDR10+, plus HLG. Yeah. Um, so on a Panasonic TV, they've got you covered if you want to use the light sensor. Um, and again, demonstration uh, that I saw with that, um, again, it was subtle. You know, very, very subtle differences. They had a, an HZ and a GZ. It's in the video, actually. Um, if you want to see how they set out the demo, um, it's in the, the, the video that I shot. Obviously, don't take anything from the images in terms of picture quality with the TVs because, like I say, the, the camera has a limited dynamic range. I had no control over the lighting um it was set at a pacific specific iso and brightness so when the room environment changes um i didn't have it on auto uh, on the camera or anything like that because i tried to keep it at a le level playing field but it gives you an idea of just how subtle it is it's not a huge difference um it probably looks more on the video actually than it actually is to to your eye um and that's just the way that the camera picks it up but yeah it's I think it's a worthwhile technology. I don't have anything against it, to be honest. And normally I would be saying, do not use this or switch it off. Um, I'd want to experiment a little bit more with filmmaker mode because obviously you're using um, HDR10, which doesn't have, it only has static metadata. Um, so it's going to rely on the TV AI a little bit more uh, in terms of um, how it's assessing the image coming in and what it does. Um, it will use the same algorithm I would imagine is the dynamic tone mapping that's where it'll be getting its its information from from the histogram and so on and again HLG doesn't have um, that metadata in there either so filmmaker mode I'd want on the Panasonic anyway I'd want to try that a little and test it a little bit more but certainly in terms of the Dolby Vision experience um, that is that is um, done by dynamic metadata so it will do do it correctly because it's frame by frame or scene by scene in terms of how it works that out yeah yeah basically all right i think we're done I, I yeah think so I've... much for so much for not happening at this show it'll be a quick half hour <laughs> <laughs> um i guess it's just given us time to to actually talk about what what was there and what was interesting um but yeah in terms of uh, in terms of the show floor um it was very very quiet um if you look at some of the uh Time lapse shots that I did of of the famous CES um, uh, sign and stuff, um, and the people walking past and all the rest of it. That's the crowds are down absolutely. Now that could be a number of things because it is more spread out now CES, and it's I've noticed that the last few years it's why I didn't stay close to the convention center this year because. Um, I only spent a day and a half in the convention halls. Um, all the rest of the time was spent in suites, in hotels, uh, closed door events, that kind of thing, um, which is the way that, that manufacturers are presenting their uh, their products now. Um, uh, they still have the, the big stands, but the big stands are more for uh, your general um, show attendees. Um, if you're more into the subject like we are uh, and covering the show and so on, they tend to have things off off site but even still I thought it was quiet there wasn't a, a great deal of buzz um, at the end of press day I looked at the number of news stories that we were doing and I'm thinking that's impressive considering nothing has been announced uh, I was I was sitting there that night 
because you know I obviously get press releases sent to me by various PR companies, and you were forwarding anything that was sent to news at AD forums. So I, I thought I, I should be getting everything, and I was nothing was coming in, and I was thinking like, am I not getting anything, or is there just no news at this show? <laughs> and uh, yeah, as it turns out, I don't think there was much news. No, and and the show was quiet and so on, and and you get this, you get this every few shows. I mean, there's been a few shows we've done in the past, Steve, where. Yeah, and you're just just running out ideas for videos because there's not a hell of a lot there. Whereas there was enough to keep me going. I was out on my own, so uh, there was enough stuff, enough interesting things to talk about, like filmmaker mode and and Dolby Vision and that kind of thing, as well as the TVs being announced. So I think we did 13 show full of videos. I'm going to do a best of roundup um, video with all the TVs that are coming this year, the TVs to look out for and so on. Um, so that'll be 14 videos in total that we've done from CES which is about average. Um, it's it's normally what we'd expect to do in terms of videos and in terms of coverage it was there but there just wasn't anything I mean even though Samsung had a nice TV and micro LED and, and Panasonic had a new flagship and you know LG are, are consistent and they had a new gallery series and so on, there was nothing there that, that really excited I mean, it's all really good product, and I'm sure you know, when we get the stuff in for review and so on, we'll be we'll be happy with 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 our lot for the year. But in terms of looking forward and and what is actually coming, um, it was just one of these those years where there wasn't a great deal being said. So hopefully that's because they're busy working on stuff, and next year we'll get it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, so for a 30 minute podcast we've ended up at 1 hour and 50 uh, in terms of recording, there's not a lot to edit out so <laughs> you've got yeah. your money's worth dear listener um, <laughs> we are back to normal um, next week's podcast, so next Monday's podcast we're back to normal, the full team will be here kicking off the new year uh, we'll be looking forward to what's coming up at the cinema this year, what films we're interested putting in putting a boot into Star Wars and- uh, <laughs> oh yeah, oh, I've forgotten all about that you know, I'd, I'd, I completely forgot about Star Wars till you mentioned it right there, Steve I, mm-hmm. I don't know what that says <laughs> Um, yeah okay so we've got lots to talk about uh, normal podcast back this week uh, if you've got any questions regarding CES um, anything we forgot to mention or anything you want us to follow up on um, in terms of specs or product announcements that kind of thing like I say we've got a few TV events that will be coming up in the next few weeks uh, which reminds me I need to talk about Philips so um, their event is coming up so if you're wondering why we haven't discussed Philips they're having their TV reveal for the year on the 21st and 22nd of this month and I'll be going over to Amsterdam for that one um, so we'll have all of their TV announcements then, um, just in case you're wondering why we, we didn't mention them, but anyway that's it for this week, thanks for your time Steve My, my pleasure Phil And uh, like I say, tune in next week for our normal podcast, thanks for listening Thanks for listening